Hello, and welcome to another edition of Wise Council Weekly, powered by Athenian Group. My name is Tanya Farley, and I'm your host, and I have with me my co-host, Alex Francis. Alex, how are you doing this morning? Tanya, I just want to take a slight moment, take a pause, and say, we got sports back, baby. We got we, sports back. Round of applause. Round of applause. We Woo! do. We do have sports back. Uh, <laughs> it, it's been, you know, getting to watch uh, baseball games, some NBA scrimmages slash games. I, I'm hoping that the, the Marlins fiasco, that for those of you all that maybe not right. following sports right now, the Marlins, I think, are up to nine players now. Maybe more. Maybe 12. That's I think it's 12. Yeah. Uh, that have tested positive for COVID in a week. Uh, so, not great. Hopefully that doesn't, uh, you know, crush the season for Major League Baseball and then, you know, derail the NFL. I know there's also a lot of players opting out of the NFL season, uh, rightfully so, right? A lot of these guys had, you know, planned to have children uh, right. during the off season so that, you know, it doesn't interact with the season. And now, you know, you're, you have a newborn at home and I, I rightfully understand their concern. So, so happy it's back saying a little prayer that, that we get things back on track, but yeah, I mean, happy Wednesday, you know, cruising through here. Uh, we're excited about, you know, the guests we have on today. Um, we are bringing on, you know, a, a, a truly incredible guest um, who is, you know, kind of a Titan in, in his industry. So I'm going to go ahead and give a, a quick intro, and then we'll talk about what our game time topic is and why we have this guy on. So we're bringing on John McClain um, this week as our guest. So he is, for those of you that don't know, he is a NFL writer for the Houston Chronicle, has been doing so for, you know, better part of four decades at this point in time. Uh, former president of the Pro Football Writers of America, uh, Texas Sports Hall of Fame inductee, Texas Gridiron legend. Fun fact, there's only three folks that are named Texas Gridiron legend by the Texas Sports Hall of Fame that are not football players. And he's one of them. Dave Campbell is one of the other ones. So those are, those are great company. Uh, 2006 Dick McCann Memorial Award winner. So for, you know, basically best sports writer of the year. And then, you know, he's been in eight movies. We'll talk about that a little bit more with him, but really overall a legend. Uh, he's going to come on and talk about our topic today, which is the evolving role of media and business and sports and really how it's changed over the last, you know, uh, you know, really the last 20 years specifically, but uh, over the last 40 years and right. how, how it's become increasingly important to have that relationship with the media, how that's changed and really how, you know, you as a business owner or, or you as a professional athlete, you as an entrepreneur with your brand can better interact with the media and understand the repercussions of, of really not interacting or, or, or interacting poorly with the media and, and how you can make that work. So, you know, we're going to talk through that then go to quick hits with, um, you know, Bobby Dixon, our managing partner, and then our big three today. Alex, you want to tell us a little about the big three? Yeah, man. Since we have John McClain coming on, we're going to do our favorite sports media personalities. It's going to be great. I'm excited. You know, we, uh, we like to have the big three applicable to the topic a lot of the time. And this week we decided to make it kind of a fun one um, and talk about some of the ones that we really enjoy. We actually get feedback from both uh, John McClain, our guests, and from Bobby Dixon this week on, mm -hmm. on their, you know, kind of big three entrance. So I think that's kind of cool. So, man, let's go ahead and dive into game time. Um, sure, so sure. It, over the last century, uh, media has really evolved immensely, uh, both in its delivery channels and in how, it interacts with business, sports, entrepreneurs, you know, brand people, whatever it may be. And so what are some of those key changes that you think of when you think about the media interaction over the last, you know, several decades, Alex? I mean, such a change from, you know, from the beginning of where we started, you know, from radio and newspaper back in the day to TVs, you know, that was a huge change. Uh, we have, you know, post pregame press conferences now. We have sports TV shows, sports podcasts. Uh, you know, websites, blogs, as well as your local newspapers are all online now, you know, and now the grand heavy, that granddaddy of them all is social media. Uh, yeah. there's a, there are numerous ways now to deliver or consume your sports news on a daily basis. Um, the improvements have given voice to the voiceless. Um, I feel like I have a few friends that will swear they're a uh, sports journalist now just because they have a Twitter page. For sure, for <laughs> it gives sure. so many more opportunities to the casual sports fan that wants to break into sports journalism. Like I mentioned, um, a lot of more opportunities to to expand your knowledge, expand you know the experience that you do have, and uh, get a foot into the door as it may be. When back in the day, it was probably just you had to go work for a station or you had to go work for a newspaper. 
Um, so lots of opportunities out there just to make money in the sports media world. Yeah, no, I think that's dead on. I think, you know, we're going to hear from John today talk about how he broke into, you know, sports media and journalism in general, but how he's seen it change over the last several decades and how he's been able to remain, you know, really one of the most, you know, prominent sports writers in America for all mm -hmm. that time. And so, you know, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I mean, you think about, you know, 50 years ago, it was really the newspaper that, that shared yeah. media with the world. And so if you think about something happened at 7 a.m., it's not coming to the world until the next day at 7 a.m. Right. And so when you think about like how media is now translated, or you, to your point, the 24-hour news cycle, I mean, it's coming out as, as things are happening. You know, I, I, I think about this all the time. I was on Twitter yesterday, and I was looking at you know, guys going on Twitter, and I, I saw Andrew McCutcheon come on Twitter and said, he's saying he's checking Twitter to see yeah. what's going on with major league baseball. Cause he's hearing it faster than his GM, his team is telling him. If you think about how that has completely changed, right? If you think about for so many years, whether it's in business, sports, entrepreneurship, the media and the businesses were partners, but it was very much a, Hey, you need to tell your people first, you need to make sure things are good within your organization. And then I'll report it. Right. You think about that there were press releases that said it couldn't be released until this time. And you know, that right. still happens today to a small faction, but there are leaks everywhere, right? You think about any time a new iPhone comes out, the initial launch is in September and we know <laughs> right. about it in May, right? You think Absolutely. about, you know, exactly. We talked about guys find out they're getting traded on Twitter, right? It's, it's a different world. And so I think to your point, you know, there's, there's a 24 hour news cycle and things are coming out so fast. Information is coming out so fast that that relationship is just different than it was before. So, I mean, really, how do you think these changes impact businesses, brands, athletes, sports professionals, sports organizations, like how those interactions change with the media to like I talked about before, it was very much yeah. a respect thing. Like, Hey, I am a media personality, but I'm not going to report this out until you guys right. figure it out. Or even more so, how do you want me to report this out, right? So right. how do you think that's changed? I mean, honestly, man, I think it's the, what you just mentioned with the highlights in real time. We're not waiting for the next day. We're not waiting until the next news cycle. Um, you get the highlights, you get the facts, you get the action right there in real time. So you got that going for you. You have uh, streaming now, so you can watch sports from anywhere. So that sometimes that's less commercial breaks for uh, the media and brands to push their advertising, so they have to use different mediums to push out the push their uh, push their excuse me push their advertising across the and also become more creative with their approaches. Um, also, like esports is now a thing, so brands are sponsoring ads for Twitch and YouTube streamers. Um, they're, so they're finding more creative ways to make sure that they're still interactive in the spaces that they can be, but also with so many opportunities out there. Um, Athletes are taking, you know, advantage of this as well. So like Sergi Baca has his own cooking show where he brings athletes on and cooks with them and interviews them. JJ Reddick and, and Gilbert Arenas have their own podcast. LeBron James has his own uh, media marketing empire. firm. Yeah, with, uh, yeah, with uh, and also has his uh, with Uninterrupted where they have and also has a show on HBO himself interviewing other athletes and, and um, artists. So from my perspective, I feel like the athletes are using their own platforms nowadays and staying away from traditional media at times. They're not forced into interviews um, that they have to do to just get more publicity. They're not forced, forced into, uh, you know, signing with a random, who knows, Vienna sausage company from overseas as their only endorsement. They can choose and partner with whoever they want on their own platforms. And it's really giving the power back to the athletes a little bit more and not getting their stories twisted around by the media at times. Yeah, no, I completely agree. You know, I think about, um, how in the past, you know, I've watched movies on, you know, some of the more successful teams from before we were born, right? You think mm -hmm. about the 1960 and 1961 Yankees, you know, I, or, you know, the, even the latest documentary we walked on, watched on the Bulls, the media were very much a part of those endeavors, right? They were in the locker room. They were friends with the players. They were friends with the owners. They were friends with the managers. And because of that, there was that mutual respect. It's like, hey, I have a story on Michael Jordan gambling or drinking and driving or whatever it may be stuff that, you know, right. we, we heard in the documentary was happening. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, for example, in 1961, you know, they talked about Mickey Mantle would go out and get blackout drunk and the next day come to the park, couldn't see and would hit two home runs. Right. right. But the reporters protected him. They talked about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think to ex that extent that happens so minimally today. Right. I think you have a few reporters that try to do that. I think about Brian Windhorst with LeBron James. Right. I think about some people like that, that, 
try and like have a great relationship with them. But really at the end of the day, I mean, you brought this up and it's so spot on social media and the 24 hour news cycle has given folks in the media and in sports and in business, a platform to have a voice so quickly, right? You don't have to go through a channel and there's pros and cons of that, right? I think about like traditionally, right? If a CEO of a major corporation was going to make an announcement, they would go through the normal media sources. They would say, Hey, we're going to release it this time. This is what it is. Right. Now, Elon Musk goes on Twitter and tweets, and based on what he does, the yeah. stock of Tesla goes up significantly yeah. or down significantly, right? right? It's, it's a different world. And so I think about how having a positive media interaction may mean with a media resource, right? Whether it's you know print, news, or otherwise, mm-hmm. but it may be you just going directly. And because of that, you have people like the Adam Schefters of the world, like the Wojas of the world that have become you know, you know, Jim Cramers that become the insiders for sports and business. Mm -hmm. And they know stuff before the general public knows they know stuff before people inside corporations inside, you know, professional organizations know things. And it gets leaked so fast that I think controlling that narrative, whether positively or negatively, something that I think professionals in media used to do to help players and, you know, do what they do professionally is kind of gone, right. And I think because of that, there's obviously, you know, we know media so fast, but you also think about, there's stories that get put out and retracted, I think, more than than ever before. So I think that, you know, for them, that interaction has changed very much significantly. So what do you think, and, you know, on that note, what do you think is an important trait for an organization, a business, a brand, you know, a, a, an athlete to possess in his relationship with the media, right? Whether it be social media or whether it be with, mm-hmm. you know, so, someone like, you know, those Adam Schefter's of the world, someone like the John McClain's of the world that, that really write true stories and break news. Like, well, how, what do you think is the most important trait for someone to have? Honestly, it's trust and being trustworthy. Um, you know, just like you mentioned with the people that were in those locker rooms with the Chicago Bulls, hearing about the stories, hearing about the gambling, hearing about the, you know, drinking overnight, stuff like that. They were trusted by that organization, trusted that they were this media source that worked with us and we work with you. Um, you know, once you allow that media person to take that type of access to you and your organization, uh, you want to know that you can trust them to tell the entire story. You want to be able to trust them to not trust your word with that story, um, you know, just to make it juicier, just to get some clickbait. And you want to put that brand, you don't never want to put that brand in a bad light and vice versa. They're trusting your organization to treat them fairly. They're trusting your organization in hopes of getting that first story uh, and knowing that you'll put a shine on it and put it in a good light. And that way the parties you know, both have a great working relationship throughout the entire time they're working together. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, the honesty, the transparency, Mm -hmm. the authenticity, right? I think you've seen it in sports, right? I think about some of the things that LeBron does on and off the court because of his relationship with Brian Windhorst, right? There's things that criticism that may come out on things and Brian Windhorst sticks up for him because he's always fed him, you know, direct truth. He's always been honest with him. So I think that's, that, that's a great example. And, you know, in professional sports, I think about in, in the professional world, right? A lot of these guys are, have, these CEOs have a great relationship with Jim Cramer on mad money. And because of that, they talk about stuff that the rest of the world doesn't know. And because of that, you know, Jim Cramer has information other people don't have. That's why there's the, the 4,000 word disclaimer at the beginning of his show, right? Which says, you know, he's got information and like, it's all recommendations. And I think because of that, right, those guys can have those kind of talks and, you know, they protect when things go south and they, they don't when, you know, when things are coming out. And so I think about, you know, we, we'll talk about with Bobby later on, we talk about Muhammad Ali and Howard Cosell, you know, very mm-hmm. similar, right? That relationship where, you know, Howard would ask the tough questions, but at the same time, he would stand up for Muhammad Ali. And so I think, you know, being honest and being transparent is really key. And, and I think too, same goes for the media personnel right. as well, right? A, a trustworthy, you know, media resource that, um, you know, has been around the block that, that really takes in information and, and uses their best judgment in whether or not the information should be shared, how it should be shared, mm-hmm. and tries to put things in the most truthful but best light. And I think, you know, our guest that's coming on today, John McClain, you know, he's going to talk a little bit about how his experience as a journalist has changed in his time frame. You know, this is a guy who has been one of the most trusted names in sports media for a long time that has been, you know, at dinner with, you know, athletes forever, right? When you think about him covering the Oilers, like he was around all of that, 
when the Texans came to Houston, he was the key piece of the media that made that happen, right? Mm-hmm. He was working directly with the ownership group, with the McNairs to make that happen. And so he's been a part of a lot of conversations, been in the locker room, been really close with guys. And he's seen how the world's kind of shifted now where the way he reports media has to be different than it was before. So mm-hmm. really excited to get him on, hear some of his stories and hear his perspectives. So without any uh, further ado, let's bring on our guest, John McClay. All right. We now welcome on the podcast our guest for the day, uh, John McClain, 45-plus year NFL writer for the Houston Chronicle, um, former president of the Pro Football Writers of America, Texas Sports Hall of Fame inductee. That's pretty cool, man. Uh, Texas gridiron legend. I know we mentioned this earlier, but I, re- I realized that there's only three Texas gridiron legends that aren't in there for playing football. So, John, that's a pretty cool honor that it's you and Dave Campbell. Um, uh, you're also a Dick McCann Memorial Award winner, and I don't think it's uh, too early to say, but probably a future NFL Hall of Famer as well. Uh, so welcome to the podcast. We're so happy to have you on. How are you doing this evening? Tanya and Alex, I'm doing great. And that Dick McCann Memorial Award got me on a plaque in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio in 2006. Greatest honor of my life. And when we finally get inducted into the Texas Sports Hall of Fame, there's only two media classes in history. And this is the second, the first one in 16 years. And we were supposed to do it at AT AT&T Stadium. Jerry Jones was turning it over to Texas Sports Hall of Fame. And then we had to postpone it for a year because of the coronavirus. And being someone who's grown up in Texas, spent my whole life here, I told my wife that was the biggest honor I've ever had. She said, it's not bigger than Canton. I said, yes, it is. She said, why? I say you're not from Texas. She wouldn't understand. (laughs) Correct, (laughs) correct. Well, I can can guarantee you that uh, we will be there for that induction for sure. Um, my wife and I will definitely be there and Alex will come with us and, and we'll come and check it out. So, um, John, you know, we, we, or we talked a little about, you know, your career um, and your accolades. So how did you get started in the industry and what really drew you to become, you know, a journalist um, and really follow that passion? I grew up in Waco. I was a diehard sports fan because my dad and my grandfather and I was eight years old when the, when the Cowboys went into the NFL and the Oilers went into the AFL when it was formed. Cowboys were terrible. That first season, they had one tie. The Oilers were great. They won the first championship, won the second championship. They lost the third championship in the longest playoff game in history at that point, double overtime. And they lost it to the Dallas Texans, who went on to become the Kansas City Chiefs the next year. They were on NBC, so I watched both. But for a kid watching the AFL with them throwing the ball all over the place, as opposed to the NFL, where it was three yards in a cloud of dust, the AFL was so much more exciting. And then when the Cowboys got good, and all of a sudden I became a diehard Cowboys fan in 1962, I listened to the first Houston Colt 45s game on radio. And I was a diehard, have been a diehard Astros fan ever since. I don't cover them, so I can say that. And and I grew up watching, listening to, and reading about Baylor. And the, the legendary sports editor at the Waco Tribune Herald, Dave Campbell, who founded Texas Football Magazine, Dave was a legend in Texas. And my dad used to toss me the sports section and say, you want to learn about what's going on in sports, you read Dave Campbell. And I could hardly read back then. I was in elementary school, (laughs) but I would read it and I would ask what the words meant. And I used to go to my elementary school library and they'd have these books with big print bios on Babe Ruth, uh, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, a lot of stars. And I read them. I read them very slow. And this was elementary school library. So they were very simple, but they were bios for kids. But I never had any idea that I would be interested in a writing career. When I was in the fifth grade, I got in a fight on a playground. I bopped this guy good. And a teacher had me write a paper. I, she told me I had to stay after school and write a 10-page paper uh, about anything I wanted. And back then, I loved science fiction. My mother was a big reader. She'd go to the library and check out books, and I'd go look at science fiction that an elementary school kid could 
could uh, read and understand, and I, most of it I did not understand, The Twilight Zone was a big TV show, Outer yeah. Limits. I watched both of them. And so uh, the teacher called my mom and dad and told them to come to school after hours. She wanted to talk to them. So I knew I was in trouble. I hadn't told my parents that I beat up this guy. So I remember going up there and my dad was so angry, embarrassed. They left me outside, went into the teacher's office. They came out, we lived, we lived a short way from there and we'd walked and we'd get back and I said, so what'd she say? And I remember my mama saying, it's the funniest thing. She told us what you did and what she had you do. And she said, she thinks that you have a, a, a chance to be a writer. I said, a writer? And she said, yeah. She said your paper was good for somebody your age, and th she thinks that we ought to consider having you pursue a writing career as you get older and take some classes. Wow. So I blew it off, didn't think anything about it, but I had that love for sports. And when I got out of high school, I had no clue what I wanted. I was a terrible student. It took me four years to get through three, and I wanted to go to Baylor. We couldn't afford it at that time, and it was hard. All my friends were there, and they were telling me how hard it was. So the smartest thing I ever did, they had a junior college at Waco, McLennan College, and I went there and took every class that would transfer to Baylor, and uh -huh. they were not hard. And I wanted easy classes because I was a bad student. My mom said, you can't remember anything you do on Hallmark, but you read Sports Illustrated or Sport or the Sporting News, a story you remember every word. I said, well, they're a lot more interesting than school. So I took a class, Introduction to Mass Communications, because everybody said it was easy. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what mass communications was. Right. And so I happened to be next to a guy, talked a lot of football with me in class. And he told me, you seem to know a lot about football. I said, I know more football than anybody to wake up. <laughs> he said, well, you're kind of cocky, too. I said, hey, I'm just being honest. So a couple of days later, he said, listen, I work for the Waco Tribune Herald. I'm a photographer. I said, what the hell are you doing in a junior college? He said, well, I'm trying to get my degree. He said, we have had somebody back out on working Friday night football. And would you be interested in it? I said, what's that? He said, we hire people to come in on Friday night, work 8 to 12. Phone will ring. You answer it. You fill out a form in which they'll call in with stats and touchdowns. And then you take it to the writers and they'll write it. I said, you get paid? He said, yeah, $25. I said, $5 an hour, that's great. Minimum wage then was like $1.50. Wow. And so I did it, and I noticed when I was doing it, I couldn't type, and we didn't have to. We just <laughs> filled out these forms, but all the sports writers that I would read in the Waco Tribune Herald would walk by me and go to the sports department. So I started to started hanging out. At midnight, everybody got up and left the correspondence, and I went in and hung out with those sports guys and got to know them. And then I went back to McLennan and took typing, shorthand, English, uh, writing, editing, everything I could because they had told me I could get paid to write about sports. I said, let me get this straight. I can go to the Astros for free. They said, yeah. I said, I can go to the Cowboys for free. They said, yeah. I said, what about Baylor? Yeah. And I'd wow. been climbing fences at Baylor and going up the wow. back entrance at Baylor basketball games. So I said, wow. And so when I was going into my junior year at Baylor, Dave Campbell hired me and I took me an extra year to get out of Baylor because I was working 60 hours a week and taking a full schedule. Didn't care anything about school except journalism and English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so and I, I graduated in summer of 75 and I came to the Chronicle in the fall of 1976 to cover the original Houston Arrows hockey team with Gordy, Marty and Mark Howe. And as I've told That's people awesome. for 45 years, learning hockey from Gordy Howe, Mr. Hockey, is like learning the Bible from Jesus. Yeah, and It was an experience I would never, ever trade for anything. That's amazing, man. Honestly, yeah. that was when we moved to Houston. Um, I was so excited about the Arrows being here. And it was their last year here because I grew up in Denver as a huge Avalanche fan. So coming, you know, and thinking I was going to get the Arrows and then having that taken away. But I mean, wow, getting to learn from Gordy Howe. I mean, you're right, man. There's there's no one better, right? Mr. Hockey himself. Speaking of the avalanche, uh, my first trip, I'd been on one plane. It went from Waco to Odessa, a little puddle hopper, <laughs> and that was for a, 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 school, a school project. So I'd been at the Chronicle for a week, and I had to travel across Canada 
and and uh, the United States on a two week road trip. Wow. And I was scared to death about turbulence. I, did, I was scared to death getting through the airports. And one of the things I noticed, Gordy Howe always worked crossword puzzles, had these little granny glasses on his nose. And I thought, okay, I'll, when there'd be turbulence, I'd look at Gordy and he'd be doing his crossword puzzles. And I'd say, hey, if Gordy Howe's not worried, I'm not worried. <laughs> and so we were, the first road trip was in Quebec City, the Nordiques, who became the Avalanche. Yep. And uh, the, the play-by-play man, uh, Jerry Truppiano gave me my start in radio in Houston. This would have been in 76. He hired me for a full-time gig in 85, and I've been doing radio here ever since. And uh, he asked me uh, if I'd like to go on radio between periods. And I said, I've never been on radio. He said, it's easy. I'll just ask you questions. I said, okay, just don't ask me about hockey. He said, why? I said, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> he said, well, how'd you get this job? I said, it's a long story. He said, okay, I'll just ask you about Waco and the Chronicle, what you think about hockey. And I said, great. So I'm looking around at the old La Colise, they call it, and all the usherettes who stood at the, at the entrance of, of every exit, and they wore these tight red skirts. They had on these tight red sweaters with these red pillbox hats like Jackie Kennedy used to wear. And they all stood at attention with their hands behind their backs. And I'm looking around at them, and I was pretty fascinated, considering everything was in French, and I didn't have, know a word they were saying. And Jerry Tribbiano slides a microphone over in front of me on a stand, and I'm waiting for my headphones. And I'm looking around, and I hear him say, so what do you think about your first trip to La Colisee? And I said, Jerry, I can't believe all the women got such big bleeps. <laughs> and I hear him go, well, you can take the boy out of Waco, but you can't take Waco out of the boy. <laughs> We're going to go to a break, see if we can get to the bottom of this, and we'll come back if the FCC lets us. <laughs> and then he goes, what in the world? You can't talk like that on the radio. I said, I didn't know we were on the radio. He said, well, why do you think you got that mic there? I said, I'm waiting for headphones like you. He goes, I'm communicating with the producer back in the office. And I was like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. He said, now, if we try this again, can you not talk like that? I said, well, of course. So either nobody was listening or nobody cared or they were interested in the usherettes in Quebec City because uh, I've been doing radio ever since. And every time I talk about something, I think first. Right. Uh, <laughs> because I remember what I said in 1976. And then shortly after, the Nordiques, who were really good, moved to moved to Colorado and Denver, and the rest is uh, NHL history. Yeah, wow, correct, wow. correct. Man, just sitting around and radio thoughts, man. <laughs> but I'm, from across the sports world, I have saw that you've been referred to as the sheriff. So I'm trying to figure out how did you come by that nickname and who was the person that gave it to you? Well, I think you guys mean the general. Uh, I've never been called the sheriff. Yeah, my nickname for decades has been the, the general. And it started in the 80s. I've never referred to myself as that because I'm not a general. I've had people ask me on the radio and emails and my mail bags, were you in, were you in the military? And I said, no. And they asked how I got the nickname. And it was 19, I think, 85 or 6. Mm-hmm. The Oilers played in Pittsburgh in a big game. Back then, we sent Chronicles sent eight people on the road. And the bosses called me and said, now make sure, and there's a primetime game. You guys are on deadline, but make sure everybody doesn't write about the same thing and use the same quotes. And I said, okay. So we were standing outside Marriott Hotel getting ready to pile in two cars. And I started telling, starting with the columnist, okay, you guys get the first two choices. Then you guys get this. You guys get that. We'll meet at halftime, then we'll double check before we go down with five minutes left, and uh, and we'll we'll adapt based on the game. And one of the columnists goes, Ed Fowler, who was a great columnist for us and is now a preacher in Oklahoma. Ed goes, huh, you sound like a general. <laughs> and so um, they just started calling me that. And uh, there's worse things to be called, and I've been called them, but I don't, uh, I I've never referred to myself as a general. Uh, that, that's a great story. It's funny. I actually heard that term for the first time. So uh, there's a sports podcast called Pardon My Take from Barstool Sports and, and, and Dan Katz and, and PFT commenter run in and they're pretty big and they, they talk about you pretty often on the podcast actually and refer to you as 
both the general and the sheriff on the podcast and, and, and they talk very fondly about you. So that's well, pretty I've cool never met either. Me. I've never met either one of them. I know who they are and I've never been called. That's the only, I've never heard that about the sheriff before, but there's worse things to be called than a sheriff too. But <laughs> in Waco where I grew up, my nickname is mad dog. And when I go mad home, dog. friends that I've known for all my life, they'll be mad dog, this mad dog, that. And the reason was in junior high, which is middle school now, I was on Halloween. And this girl, I was in the seventh grade, was going to let me kiss her. And she told me she was going to give me a French kiss. I didn't know what that was, but she made it sound really interesting. So she yeah, told I me bet. to meet her, <laughs> meet her, like, say, 7 o'clock on Halloween. And I was running late at my house. So to get there, I started running through yards and jumping through fences <laughs> because she was really cute. And I knew this was going to be something monumental in my life. So I was jumping fences and running through neighborhoods and a dog bit me and I kept going and uh, she didn't show up dog bite. <laughs> and she didn't show up. So I go oh. back, I go back home with my head between my legs and my arms bleeding. And my dad said, what happened to you? I said, I got bit by a dog. Well, who's I said, I don't know where, I don't know. What do you mean? You don't know. So I told him the truth. And back then, to get, uh, if they couldn't find a dog and the mm. owner, you had to get rabies shot. Mm. And so I got a rabies shot. That would have been like in 1965, somewhere in there. Yeah. And so all my friends started calling me Mad Dog. Mad Dog. And when I played football in junior high, I was a middle linebacker, Mad Dog McLean. Hey, that's a, that's a fitting nickname, man. I Every once in a while, somebody will call me on 610. In fact, probably about 1990, guy called one time. And he said, uh, do your co-hosts know that you're Mad Dog McLean, middle linebacker and fullback from the Tennis and Texans? And I said, no. And they're like, what, what? You Mad Dog, what? And uh, turned out it was a guy I went to school with and played in a band with. And uh, he's a lawyer in Beaumont. Hadn't heard from him in decades. But that kind of got out. But uh, I don't get that much except from Clint Sterner on Sports Radio 610 because I told the Mad Dog story. So he calls me Mad Dog. Cool. Well, we're going we're gonna to have to call in and reference to you as that uh, when, oh, yeah. when we, we do that for sure. So speaking of that, you've been covering the NFL, you know, and the arrows and a bunch of other things for several decades now. And you've seen, you know, the media distribution channels, you know, you talked about you were taking phone calls and writing down stuff from Friday night, you were learning how to type, you know, you watch the, the print media evolve. And now you have a constant 24 hour news cycle. So how has that changed the way you approach writing as someone who's been a columnist for a long time and, you know, also a radio and TV personality, how has like your approach changed or is it still the same with, you know, knowing that there's people trying to break news all the time just for the sake of breaking news. Tanya and Alex, I can't tell you how much this business has changed. Used to when it was just the Chronicle versus the Post, you had a newspaper to put out. Every night I went to bed with a knot in my stomach, worried that the Post was going to have something that I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time they didn't, I can say, because that's a fact. <laughs> and uh, But I worried about it. I still worry about it. Now, the way it used to be, I could go to an Oilers practice, hang out there all day, hang out in the dressing room could go in a dressing room when the players were in meetings and sit at front of lockers and read the newspapers, do anything we wanted. And we got to know the players. You got to talk mm -hmm. to them. You got to know, hear about their families, about their schools, the teammates and former teammates. And, and you don't do that anymore because we're restricted so much. The media is a kind of a necessary evil. And uh, back then we weren't. And so I would go home, get home about five o'clock and I'd transcribe tape and I'd write. I might get my stuff in, a story and a notebook. And if there's any news, I'd try to have it all in by seven. If it need to be later, it could be. And now back then we used to say you write it or you read it. In other words, if you don't write it, somebody else says, so write it or read it. Now it's tweeted or read it. Mm -hmm. And the problem now like when the internet came, I embraced it. I didn't want to be like a lot of my friends and turn my nose up at it and say, right. I'll never do anything on there. I did video. I did Q and A's. I did a thing with our former columnist, Richard Justice, Justice McLean. And we did all kinds of things for HoustonChronicle.com. And, uh, and it got a lot of recognition for it. That's one reason that I got, uh, I have a hundred, I have 141,000 Twitter followers. I had, 145 and I've lost almost 
let's say you guys are rice guys, what's 141 from 145? I've lost that many because I retweet so many negative Donald Trump stories and people unfollow me because they don't like uh, being negative toward Trump. Gotcha. And I'm not going to stop. I don't care how many followers I lose. And so uh, I've, I, tr I do, uh, I'm on the air six times a week in uh, sports radio 610 in Houston twice a week in Waco, twice a week in Nashville. This is 24 years I'm doing on the Titans flagship since they moved. The Oilers did. I've done radio up there twice a week. I do a show in Knoxville once a week, San Antonio, Austin, once Ooh. a week for years. Wow. I did a weekly show in St. Louis, weekly show in, in Corpus, and I try never to turn anybody down, whether it's a wow. talk show. Used to do a lot of TV for NFL Network. ESPN, and then they hired so many correspondents, they didn't need me anymore, which is good because I don't have to dress. And I'm not somebody, I've got a, I've got a look for radio, not TV. Anyway, <laughs> I don't look like you guys. You guys would be great for TV. Oh, and so yeah. I've been very blessed with what I do. And today, everything I write goes on our paid website, TexasSportsNation.com. I don't write for the free site, Crime.com. I do two podcasts a week. Facebook Live, I write three or four columns. Um, I do a mailbag on Friday. So basically a Rip Bill O'Brien weekly mailbag. <laughs> and uh, so I like doing it because there's no space limitations in cyberspace. Yep. And all my, all my columns still end up in the Chronicle. All those other things are for TexasSportsNation.com. And so you either evolve or die. Your career dies. So many of my friends have been forced into retirement, retired, uh, been fired because they wouldn't or couldn't adapt to the internet and the changing times of the 24 seven news cycle. And the worst thing about it, I had to give up golf because you can't play golf and have your phone on and some buddies in a backswing with money on the line. And all of a sudden your phone goes off. So I put my sticks up uh, and I told my wife, whenever I retire, get put out to pasture, I'm getting those sticks back out of, <laughs> out of the attic and I'm going to crank it up again. Wow. Lo love that. <laughs> as soon, as soon as that happens, man, we'll be more than willing to play golf with you for sure. Thank we, you. Um, I'm going to have to start over. Hey, that's, that's all right. right. I, I think be on my level. Then, I was going to say, I, you know, <laughs> I think we're all kind of at that level. So no worries. But you mentioned something really interesting during that, that I want to kind of circle back to. You talked about, you know, with the Oilers, you'd hang out in the locker room all day. You'd get really close with the guys. I'm sure the guys really trusted you with, you know, the information and, and you were truthful with them and they were truthful with you. Now, you know, there's this setup where folks can go directly to social media and share their own stories or, you know, everyone's like you talked about, it's a race to break news. How has that relationship with players and with organizations changed in the last, you know, 40 years, as far as how you interact with them and, and how they, you know, weigh so heavily on their personal brand through social media. And now it's really, you know, that relationship is not as strong as I think it maybe once was. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. When I covered the Oilers, um, I was, I've never been friends with anybody when I cover them. You can't because you write too many things or tweet too many things they're not going to like. Sometimes right. if they think you're your friends, you don't understand. Early in my career, I had an Oilers general manager. I had to write a thing. He, he slapped a replay official because he didn't like the, that he wouldn't change a call. And nobody knew it because the guy was in a booth. But somebody, they oh, called wow. me, told me, Wow. So I called him for confirmation, the general manager, and he denied it. And I called this guy who was older, and he told me the whole story. And another guy in there collaborated it. I mean, I mean, collaborated. No, collaborated. what's the word? Collaborated. It. Yeah. 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 And uh, so I wrote it. And the general manager said, as a professionally, I understand you had to write the story. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't. And I knew right then that I couldn't be friends with this guy. And one time I had to write a negative story at the end of a season and I ripped him and we held it a day and ran it on Christmas. And his wife called me and chewed me out for running it on Christmas. <laughs> and, and I felt terrible because I didn't write it to be run on Christmas. Yeah, and, right. But now that I don't cover the Oilers anymore, I'm friends with a lot of them and all the friendships have been after the careers ended. And I do a lot of fundraisers with them. I go, like on the gridiron ledge and a lot of former 
players around the state and coaches are gridiron legends and we we uh support the new class every year at the kickoff classic we come back at the bowl game at energy stadium we have two or three charity appearances a year we have a golf tournament we do that's charity and i see them all the time and i'm friends with a lot of them and i really like them and awesome. that's because i got to know them well now the rules are such that nfl uh Pro Football Writers of America, our rules are this. Media gets to spend 45 minutes interviewing players a day. But the problem is they're not all in there. And if, say, I want to go have a conversation with J.J. Watt, uh, I couldn't talk to him because here would come 30 people with microphones wanting to talk to him. Right. And so I can't do it. I've had one conversation with J.J. Watt who came here in 2011 in which other people weren't around, and it lasted more than a minute. And that was when he wow. came into my office at the stadium for me to do an interview with him about five years ago. Never had a conversation with Andre Johnson until he retired. Now I've had several with him one-on-one. -on -one. And and so I, I really liked guys like Eric Winston, the offensive tackle who okay. just retired yeah. as head of the union, executive director, and Indy Kalu. Andy Kalu used to be on Sports Radio 610. I got him in there. Now he's been for years at 790. He and I did a TV show for two years. Now I see him quite a bit. We're on the selection committee of the Houston Sports Awards at Houston Sports Hall of Fame. And there's a lot of guys, and I, I always like Kubiak. Gary Kubiak is one of my favorite all-time people. But I, in all the years I've known Gary, we were one place one time to have a beer, and that's it. And I've had conversations with him and we text each other and I'd like sometimes just kick back, talk football with Gary, but uh, he's still coaching and he's out of town. But someday when he retires, if I'm still around, I'd love to sit down with Gary Kubiak. So it's not the same today. Media's held at arm's length. The fact is there's no accountability now. You can write lies. You can make up stuff. You see people breaking stories saying could, maybe, should. And if they're wrong, they say, oh, I didn't say it. And so there's so much bad news. People steal stories and don't yeah. credit. They rewrite press releases and act like they have it on their own. And it drives me crazy that there's no ethics like there used to be and should be. Yeah, oh, I agree. And we you know, agree completely on that. And we also agree on the Gary Kubiak front. We, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to play with Klein, Kubiak at Rice. And so we got to spend quite a bit of time around Gary. And obviously, you know, Klein and I, I'm not going to say that we spoke it into existence, but for several years, Klein and I talked about how awesome it would be for Gary to come back and coach the Broncos and, and win a Super Bowl. And then it <laughs> happened. So I can say that was a happy ending for me as a, you know, a grow up in Denver and, and, watching the Broncos, you know, it was cool to see Kubiak come back and win. So we agree that that'd be a great setup for you. If you think about it, of course, John Elway's the all time most popular uh, player yeah. from Denver. And in fact, he was smart enough to hire Kubiak. And, um, but if you think about what Gary did as offensive coordinator and then comes back as a head coach and briefly he was in personnel and like when we would go up there, you know, the Kubiak name is magic in Denver, as you know, Tanya. And, and uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of players in the Hall of Fame besides Elway. Who is more popular in Denver than Gary Kubiak other than John Elway? Yeah, there's really not. A, I mean, from from the Broncos, there's not, right? It, you'd have to go to to the Avalanche probably to have someone or, or maybe Larry Walker from the Rockies, I would say, or kind of the Colorado sports legends. The Colorado team, man. And I mean, wow, you're mentioning so many names and so many stars and, you know, just being on from radio to TV shows and, and, and even throw in Indy Kalu, who's a friend of the firm. But you've also been in several movies, including The Longest Yard, Game Plan, The Secretariat, just to name a couple of them. Like, what was the experience like, and how did you, you know, get those opportunities to join, you know, a motion picture? Alex, I'm a, I'm a movie nut, always have been. While my dad loves sports, my mom loved movies. And so I started going to them when I was a kid on Saturdays when I was a little kid. They would take me and drop me off at the 25th Street Theater in Waco, and I would enter hula hoop contests, all kind of things, and sit through double features and cartoons. And people asked me, if you hadn't 
been what you are today, what do you think you would have done? And I said, well, I hope I would have been a movie producer, the guy who puts the deals together. And I think that's a fascinating business. And so uh, in 2000, some Baylor friends of mine said they knew I was a movie nut. He said, we're going to go over to Austin. There's a movie being filmed. It's the first directing job by John Lee Hancock. We're going on the set. Do you want to go? I said, sure. And I knew who John Lee Hancock was. He's from Texas City. His dad and his brother played football at Baylor. And John Lee had a... Uh, he moved to, to write a script and he left, he left Houston where he was an attorney to move to LA to try to make it as a screenwriter. And he sold the script to Pete, Clint Eastwood and Kevin Costner in 1993, the movie A Perfect World, starring Costner and Eastwood. That's yeah, how he wow. got his foot in the door. Now he's directed a lot of big time movies and he's, he's big time. And at the time it was his first. So I went over with the Baylor guys he was younger than me, and I didn't, I didn't know him, but I, Dennis Quaid was the star, and it's interesting to me, it was the first movie of Jay Hernandez, who now plays Magnum on CBS on Friday nights, the sec, to, second Thomas Magnum to uh, Tom Selleck, and so uh, I spent a day with him, and then I, I got to know Hancock a little bit, and I went back a couple other times, because it was in May, and there was nothing going on with NFL. Took a couple of friends over that like movie, like former Oiler defensive end Sean Jones was a film fanatic too. I took him one time. And so Hancock said to me one day, you want to come to the Rangers ballpark? We're going to shoot uh, Jim Morris getting his big debut against the Rangers for the Devil Rays. And I said, be an extra and what? He said, well, press box scene. I said, sure. I said, how many are you going to have? He said, oh, I don't know. The head of the extras would, would know that. I said, where do you get extras? He said, well, they just, they do a call and people show up. And I said, well, let me ask you. I said, I could fill that press box with legitimate media people who would help you promote this movie. He goes, really? I said, yeah, guys that have talk shows, guys that write columns. He said, well, that's a great idea. Tell the tell the I'll talk to the head of the extras so I had people from Houston Dallas Fort Worth and it was funny because the two producers they were young guys mm -hmm. Mark Chiardi and Gordon Gray and this was their first movie and when I was in Austin outside Austin we were in Thorndale they didn't give me the time of day and they knew I knew Hancock and that was it and so when we got that day it was a Sunday morning to the ballpark the Dallas Morning News and the Fort Worth Star-Telegram had on the front of their sports sections columns and stories by people, I'm, gonna, I'm going to Hollywood. My good friend John McClain has me in this movie called The Rookie. So when I showed up, these two young producers, uh, <laughs> Gordon and Mark, all of a sudden I was their best friend. Oh, McClain, great to see you. Come on over here. So I got to know them. They put me out. They had me in The Rookie. Invincible, The Game Plan, uh, The Longest Yard remake, and uh, Secretariat. I did four others, and the last one was Spring Breakers with Selena Gomez and James Franklin. And uh, so I got my foot in the door, talked about it on the radio, called a friend of mine on radio in L.A., told the producers, be listening to KTLA at 4 o'clock on Monday afternoon. So this, this talk show, I was new, I like movies, needed it too. And I told him I need to give a plug about the movie I was in. He said, sure. So I talked about it. I talked about the producers. I was gold with them. I was gonna and say, the last yeah. time I talked to them, they said, well, you know, uh, we're not going to be do, doing as many sports movies and we'd like to use you, but uh, you're going to have to lose a little weight. And I said, I said, okay, if you need me, for a nude love scene, I need a personal trainer in three years to get ready. And so obviously I didn't care about being in the movies. And so I haven't been in one since, uh, since uh, spring breakers, I have a bad agent and that agent is me. <laughs> hey, well, that's, that's a great track record of movies to be in. You know, it's funny. Yeah, I, <laughs> I've seen every single one of those. And actually when we we're uh, preparing for this interview, I rewatched several of them. And it's funny because, you know, obviously knowing you now, uh, going back and rewatching, you know, I realized that I watched, you know, you throughout my childhood as well. So I thought that was pretty cool to see. Well, thanks for not blinking. And the one that I did that I liked <laughs> the most other than Spring Breakers what, and The Longest Yard was called Cook County. 
and Cook County was filmed. It was about a cover story in Texas Monthly, crystal meth addiction on multiple families in the Piney Woods. And I was one of the few people in there who was not a crystal meth addict. I played Uncle JD and uh, it's on Netflix. And, uh, and Anson Mount, who's now Captain Kirk, uh, he was in it, some other character actors were in it. And we had a blast filming it. And one of the things we did, we rented out for two nights, the old River Oaks Theater, oh, wow. uh, over in the right in the River Oaks Shopping Center. And we had the 400 seat uh, auditorium and they was sold out both nights. And they put my name up on the marquee, wow. said starring wow. John McClain and underneath Anson Mount, Sandra Berkeley, Ryan Donahoe. And uh, so all my friends were having me stand under the marquee and taking my picture and everything. And that's that was, awesome. That was a pretty cool event. Yeah, that's super cool. You know, for, for a guy that has so many accolades, that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty awesome thing to add for sure. And especially in something you're really, really passionate about. It was so in a you, bunch of film festivals, excuse me, Daniel, and there was a film festival in Austin, South by Southwest, which is the biggest in the United States, along with Sundance and one of the top three in North America, along with the Toronto Film Festival. And so uh, it was packed. I remember it was a theater somewhere in Austin. It was raining like crazy. I thought, sure, the rain would uh, keep people away. And so people were lined up to get in the theater in this multi-screen multiplex. And so I went and got the star and the director and I said, you guys come with me. And they said, what? I said, we're going to go out and talk to all the audience because there's an audience award that people vote on the best movie. And Ooh, like Anson, yeah. Mount, Anson Mount had been in a bunch of movies, including Crossroads with, with uh, Britney Spears. And he'd been in movies with De Niro. And, and I told him, I said, come on. So we did. We went up and down that line. And after that movie was over and I walked out, I was walking out of the theater and these journalists were come up and interviewing me about my part in the movie. And it's the only time I've ever been interviewed when it wasn't involved in sports. And it was the only time I actually felt like a legitimate actor, which I'm not, but it was an incredible experience. Oh, that's awesome. And you, you can't say you're not a legitimate actor. You have an yeah. IMDb page yeah. with multiple movies. I think well, I don't know who does that. I've never looked at it. I do have a Screen Actors Guild card now for a long time. And, uh, and it's awesome. been fun. And I, 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 I love being on movie sets. People are bored to death on movie sets. They can't believe how excited I am. And I said, let me tell you what's boring. Sitting around a locker room, waiting for naked football players to come out of the shower. And they're like, oh, wow, that would be great. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like different world, different world. So I got to ask, we were just talking about movies. What's your all-time favorite movie? Do you have one or do you have a couple? Uh, well, I have, I have many, but I'll say this. I ask people a lot, if you were marooned on, a, on an island and you were never going to get off and you could have one movie, what would it be? Mine would be the original Godfather, which I think is a classic. And oh, my number yeah. two choice would be Pulp Fiction. I've seen those movies so many times, and uh, and I thought both of them were great. And uh, those would be my two that I would want to watch. People ask me sometimes, what are your all-time favorite sports movies? I say The Rookie, The Longest Yard, Invincible, Game <laughs> Yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Those are both those are all great, great calls for movies for sure. I think uh, Alex and I have seen all those and I definitely like rank some of those in my in my top 10 as well. Um, you've mentioned a number of other you know sports media personalities you've worked with or, or 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 seen over the years. And our on our podcast every week we do a big three, right? So our, our big three this week is um, sports media personalities that that we enjoy, whether it be from our childhood or or currently or wherever it may be. So is there one sports media personality that that you really enjoy, either currently or from the past, that that maybe you looked up to or, or you really enjoy their content that the content that they put out? Uh, when I was a kid, 1963, I went to Baylor football games and Baylor had an all america quarterback, Don Trull and an all america receiver, Lawrence Elkins. And they opened the season beating Syracuse with Larry Zonka and Floyd Little mm -hmm. and this great team from Syracuse. And Baylor threw the ball a lot back then. Most teams didn't. 
And so Don Troll and Lawrence Elkins were on the cover of Life Magazine, Sports Illustrated. They were larger in life. And now I'm really good friends with both of them. To have heroes when you're a little kid that you look up to and you meet them later in life, both of them are gridiron legends and I see them all, all the time. That has been very cool. And to cover so many players and present them for induction actually present them to the, to the Pro Football of Fame Selection Committee to help them get in the Hall of Fame. Guys like Oilers defensive end, Elvin Bethea, guard Mike Munchak, nose tackle Carly Cobb, guard Bruce Matthews, quarterback Warren Moon, outside linebacker Robert Brazil, Earl Campbell was before awesome. I got on the committee. They've all gotten in in my 28 years on the committee, and I've presented them. I'm not the only one doing it, but I take the lead. And I take so much pride in that because I know how much it means to them. And I know how much it means to other fans. And there's still many of them out there. And I love to hear from them, just like I love people asking me about players and coaches. You know, what do you think about this guy? What do you think about that guy? What was Dennis, Dennis Quaid like? What was The Rock like? What was asking me about all these guys I've been in movies with? And, uh, and some of them I knew, some of them I don't. What's Adam Sandler like? And so uh, that's very cool. The story that I did that I was the most proud of was in 1995, I noticed that uh, Don Hudson, great receiver for the Packers, died. And I looked at the original class to the Hall of Fame from 1963. It was a 15-member class, and there was only one alive, Sammy Ball. Slinging Sammy Ball. Oh, from the nice. Ends. Sammy went to TCU. He lived at uh, West Texas. And Sammy at the time was 86. And I thought, you know what? That'd make a great story. The last surviving member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So I didn't know him, but I knew a guy here who did. And I called him and I said, how well do you know Sammy Ball? He said, I know some bitch really well. <laughs> and I'd say some bitch because that's what Sammy says all the time. Yep. And it's the only time Chronicle ever ran a story with cuss words in it because it was the essence of his personality. So we went to Lubbock, rented a car. Chronicle picked up the tab for my friend Bill. And we drove to Sam's Ranch at the base of the Double Mountains where he'd lived since the 30s. And Sammy... Would never been to the Pro Football Hall of Fame since his induction. They would send a charter plane for him, anything to get him to come back. But he wouldn't leave there unless he could be back in his bed that night. They even offered to get his bed and haul his bed to Canton wow. if he could come back. And so he lived there by himself, and he liked to play dominoes. So he and my buddy Bill started playing dominoes. I have nine hours of tape with Sammy Ball telling stories about his life playing minor league baseball with the Cardinals, with the Gas House Gang, and then playing uh, against the Negro League team, which was the greatest collection of baseball players he's ever seen. Oh. Being in the stands at Griffith Stadium for Washington and hearing the PA man call out people's names and seeing them get up and leave while the Redskins were playing and finding out afterward the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and they were calling officers to report oh, wow. to their stations. And he told so many stories and I wrote nine pages and, and wow. they were open pages. That means there were no ads. Mm -hmm. And I took some pictures of him and I asked him, he had a, he had a, uh, a cabinet in which he had some awards, but it wasn't big. And I said, Sammy, what's your greatest reward? And he reached into the back and he pulls out a piece of paper and blows dust off of it and holds it up. It was his only hole in one. I said, so all those <laughs> awards that you won in the NFL and, and playing baseball, I said, that's your biggest honor? He said, yep. And he cussed like a sailor. And and he was so fascinating. It was like I had walked into a storehouse of memories of the NFL and baseball. And for listeners who don't know what the Gas House Gang was, Google it. Because those guys went on to win World Series and go to the Hall of Fame for the St. Louis Cardinals. And he was in their minor league system. Back then, you had to make money. And the, the NFL team that won the championship would barnstorm across the South playing games against local teams to make extra money for the owner. And when Sammy played, 
you could hit the quarterback. Think about this. It's crazy. When the ball snapped, you could hit the quarterback till the play was dumped, blown dead. So wow. Sammy could throw a short pass to a split in. Mm -hmm. He could run 75 yards zigzagging while the defensive players chased Sammy to wow. knock him down. And he would have to try to dodge him. And, of course, they changed that rule. But that was – and we ran it. And the Chronicle is the only time I remember the Chronicle running out of sports sections because so many wanted it. And uh, and it was just still the best of all the great athletes and coaches that I've been blessed to interview. Mm -hmm. Sammy, slinging Sammy Ball was the best. And uh, when I was leaving with him, he ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. He gave me and Bill – a bag of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, <laughs> and he's standing on his porch. And I said, Sam, why have you lived out here all this time? How come you haven't? He's lived it's close to Sweetwater. I said, why have you moved into Fort Worth? And he starts unzipping his pants. And I step away, <laughs> and he, he pulls it out and starts taking a leak, he said, because I can piss off my porch anytime I want. <laughs> there and, there. and you can't do that when you live in the city. And feel free to join me before you go. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's, that's a awesome. phenomenal story. Yeah, that's answer. awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Man, and with you being such a, or just probably gonna be our last question before we let you go, but with you being such a huge Astros fan, even back from when the Colt, Colt 45 days, to all the way up to getting this 2017 World Series championship with this controversy that's been coming, that's been brought to light, lady. I want to hear what's your take on it as a sports writer, and you know, especially this, you know, hit by pitch numbers that we're seeing is currently skyrocketing. Well, first of all, Alex, I've suffered with the Astros since the first pitch of their first game in 1962. One time, I go, my wife and I try to go every year spring training as fans to watch games. In fact, when I got off the plane in March. My cell phone lights up, baseball canceled spring training. And uh, so one time, Drake McLean, the owner, and I knew Drayton a little bit because he's a mm -hmm. Baylor alum. And when I saw him, he used to always want to talk about Baylor football. So he asked me to come to his office in Kissimmee, and I did. And he said, let me ask you something. Why is it a football guy knows so much about my baseball team? I listen to you on the air, and, and you know more about baseball than anybody. And I said, well, unlike you, I don't believe the Astros were born when you bought them. I said, do you know who played the first game, who they beat, who pitched, and who hit two home runs? Ooh. He said, nope. But can you? I said, yeah. Bobby Shantz got the victory over the Cubs when Mama has hit two home runs. I said, you ought to know that. You grew up in Cameron. He said, yeah, but I was making money in my dad's grocery. And I said, well, if I could have made money in your dad's grocery and become a billionaire and bought the Astros, I'd have been working with you, too. And so when they won the World Series, of course, I was ecstatic like everybody else. Did they cheat? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it tarnished? Yes, it is. They'll forever be known as cheaters. But what bothers me, and I ask people on radio around the country, especially in 2017, about the 2017 season, and they're just trashing the Astros. And I'll say, I remember on W Fan in New York, I said, do you believe Rob Manfred's investigation? that they cheated in 2017, won a World Series. He goes, well, of course. And he blasted them. I said, well, why don't you believe his investigation if they found no evidence they cheated last season? And I tell people he sounded like Porky Pig. Blah, 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 because he didn't have an answer. <laughs> yep. So the thing with the Dodgers in here, I wish there had been fans. <laughs> oh, I do too. I do too. And when Joe too. Kelly, who was part of a cheating World Series winner with the Red Sox, yep. when he threw over Bregman's head at 3 0 with a 5 2 lead, that was obviously a dirty pitch. And if he'd hit him, I remember when Dickie Thon's career, Astros shortstop, great player, his career was never the same after he got beaned. And I thought about him and then Correa and then Kelly acting like a little child. Like yep. And so I thought he was a little, uh, what he called, what he called Correa or whiny little, little, he's like, Oh, my pee pee hurts. And so I was glad they suspended him for eight games. They have protested it. I'm guessing that they'll reduce it because that's the equivalent of 21 games. I was going to say that's a big suspension yeah. now. Yeah. 78,000 it's going to cause him. So they're going to reduce it. I still haven't figured out why they find Dusty Baker. I don't know what they did for Dusty to get fined. Oh, I didn't but, see that. 
but like tonight, they've been all business, and right now it's one to one in eighth inning. The Astros have got great pitching from all their rookies, and I want them to win this game, send the Dodgers home, yep. knowing that yep. they split that series, not swept it. Yep. No, I agree. I agree. Well, John, we cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing so much incredible knowledge, not only about how the industry's changed, but I think some incredible stories. I personally am going to be scouring the internet to try and find the Sammy Baugh story. So if you have that somewhere mm -hmm. digitally, you can send to us. I would love to read that. Um, but seriously, thank you so much. Uh, we, we can't, can't thank you enough. We look forward to having you on again and, and uh, talking to you soon. Tanya and Alex, thank you. It's my pleasure. Anytime. The headline on that story was called The Last Gunslinger. And it was Sammy Ball, The Last Gunslinger. It ran in the Houston Chronicle. I believe it was 1995 when Sammy was 86 years old. I've seen it on the internet. And uh, I'd be honored if you guys would check it out. But if you do, make sure you got a while because it is long. Hey, we'll check it out and we'll do one better. We'll link it. We'll link it in the show notes as well. So everybody else listening can check it out. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. Stay safe. Appreciate it, John. All right. We now head into quick hits with managing partner, Bobby Dixon. Bobby, how are you doing this morning? Great guys. Happy Wednesday to you. All right. I agree, man. It's been a great day so far. We had a great interview with our guest, John McClain today, and we talked with him about the changing role of media and sports and business over the last several decades and how image and media interaction has become really so important, right? Can really make or break you more than ever before. Since Athenian has really pivoted in recent years to more of an online presence, how important is transparency and honesty in what a business shares online? So how important is are living our values, not only in person, but online. So, I, I, you know, Tanya, I think it's a, a great point you make. Uh, short answer is very important, right? You know, and in today's age where information flows so quickly and so broadly, you know, via online platforms, it's, it's different than it used to be, right? You could, for instance, put a presentation out to a specific uh, and dedicated audience, right? And then you could pull it back and tailor it and retrofit it for the next audience. And you would do it again and again and again, right? And, but uh, on a limited scale was that content, you know, getting out there and you can kind of control it. When you put that stuff out there now, right? Whether it be value statements, mission statements, content around capabilities, experiences, people, whatever it is, right? I mean, it's got to, it's Everywhere. got to stand up, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to stand up. And, and once it's out there, it's out there. And it's got to be congruent, right? And consistent. Uh, everything from, you know, who are you representing uh, as your employees, right? And, and you know, because Google searches and word searches and LinkedIn searches and, uh, you know, what have they done in the past, right? And right. how's that going to tie back to your brand? Then you think about the content you put out, right? And, and so... I would say it's extremely important. You know, the one thing that we can control, right, is um, is kind of, you know, what we say and, and how we say it, right? Mm -hmm. And you've heard me mention, you know, numerous times on this podcast is that we try to just be consistent to our values, uh, to the pillars that we line up. And so that as we're measured, at least we're measured against sort of the same inconsistent things. But, you know, it, it's it's a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting used to it just as as everyone else is. And as a management consulting firm, it's just very important that the content that we put out, you know, mm -hmm. regarding our capabilities, our experiences, our people and our values uh, just stays consistent. Yeah, I think that's Absolutely. great. I mean, that's what we heard from Luke last week, right? It's what we heard from John today, Alex. And I think that's a, a great continuation, right? Not only in your personal brand, but in your professional brand. And then hearing from a media personality, you know, himself, and then, you know, how that carries into us. So I think I completely agree with you, Bobby. I think it's a great point. Definitely, Bobby. And as someone who's played sports at the highest levels, um, but also spent a little bit of time in the media with as a sports broadcaster, um, how difficult do you think it is to become uh, has, how difficult do you think has, it has become for journalists to give honest opinions while maintaining that key professional relationships, just like you mentioned with keeping that same consistency as they go forward? Yeah, Alex, it, uh, you know, very difficult, right? You know, I had the, the honor and distinction of being the, uh, the color analyst for the, for the mighty Rice Owls, right? Your football team. So, you know, John Gruden on Monday Night Football, I wasn't, uh, but, you know, did get a chance to spend some time in the broadcast booth 
understand how production goes and, and, and all that good stuff. I would say it's difficult, right? You know, you know, times as we as we mentioned on the last question have changed, uh, and part of that change is that you know, in broadcasting in journalism, you know, the concept and idea of freedom of speech, right? You know, relative to to you know opinions, if you're writing a um, a thought leadership perspective or a um, a column or, or anything like that, or even if you're covering a sports team, right? you know, your opinion, you know, uh, assuming it was professional in nature, right, uh, respectful in nature and all those things, right, you know, was your opinion, you know, you could say that, you could comment on a game, you could comment on a situation, you could even comment on a, on a, on, on perhaps a, 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 a macro context, right, you know, and it was just left for the audience to, to in, hear, take in, consume, interpret, and, and then you're on. Right now, now, nowadays, you've got to be very mindful, right? We talked about kind of content, you know, via businesses online. You know, if you're on the radio, if you're on television, or even if you're in print or, or online, um, you know, journalism, you, you hit sin. Right. And that perspective is out there, right? And it's left for interpretation, right? Uh, and that interpretation does not consider or take into account kind of where you were coming from, right? What the macro context was. Uh, and all that stuff, Alex. So it, it's it's become increasingly difficult to balance sort of, you know, personal opinion, you know, and just kind of managing, you know, the consumer's perspective on it. Um, certainly glad I'm not in that industry today. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> we, we are as well, man. We like it where you're at, for sure. <laughs> I mean, I think you hit on a key point, which is once you hit send, it's out there. I mean, that's one of the things that John talked about as far as how media has changed since he started, you know, in print media, you know, 50 years ago, 45 years ago, is this a 24 hour news cycle now? And it stays forever. He's like, you know, you could write a newspaper article and take a strong opinion and there'd be, you know, a large population, but not close to as large as a population now that sees it, you know, now he sends a tweet out and, you know, a million people see it, right. It's, it's right. a different world. So, well, and then it, is retweeted right yeah. uh and then retweeted right and like you say something that would in old days you know run for a day yeah. uh right it just tends to you know find new life right yeah. uh and, and you, you know the life cycle of a tweet right for right. instance right. uh depending on what that tweet is could be you know, it could be something you, you, you might not be able to come back from yeah that six degrees of separation happens in yeah. seconds right yeah. it's it's yeah. not it's not months anymore right. so all right. So our big three today um, is, a, is a little bit of a fun one with John coming on today. We wanted to kind of mix it up. So our big three today is our favorite sports media personalities could be living from the past, could be currently whatever it is. So we thought we'd ask you who who's your favorite sports media personality that you either listen to or, or watch or, or used to watch whatever it you know, may be um, that that really kind of inspired you and why. So I'll, I'll give you three, two of two, Ooh, two okay. of which are, are kind of uh, bonus you know, points here. Uh, right? there we go. Know, <laughs> from, from, two, two of which are from the past. One of which you guys are probably going to have to Google, uh, and I'm going to date myself. But Howard Cosell, uh, okay. you know, comes to mind. Howard was a, a journalist and sportscaster, you know, days of old, uh, with the likes of you know Muhammad Ali and and and, and those. And but but the reason I say that was he had a way of building rapport. Uh, with athletes, right, you know, to get them to be, you know, candid, uh, you mentioned transparent and genuine, right, and, and and they had a way of even through discord and disagreement, right, you know, with athletes, you know, getting them to stay engaged, right, you know, and, and meaningful and thought-provoking conversation. Now, Howard came along at a time where, I mean, you know, politically, socially, you know, civically, there were some monster issues, right? right you know, uh, and the convergence of athletics, you know, uh, on those issues was was, um, was was very profound, right? So he had to navigate those waters. So it was just a great, uh, I encourage you if you haven't, um, or haven't in a while to kind of dig up some of those old Howard Cosell, Ali interviews, Howard Cosell, pick any athlete, he was great. Uh, yeah. Stuart Scott is another one. Let yep. me just jump in real quick on Howard sure. Cosell because we uh, actually, when I was doing you know research for this, uh, I came across Howard Cosell yeah. because 
I personally love old Muhammad Ali videos, love them. And so, you know, those videos where they're going at it with each other and they'd go, you know, it'd be playful, but then all of a sudden they'd shift to a real topic, like yeah. something like you talked about, like whether it was, you know, religious issues with Muhammad Ali, whether it was race issues, you know, with the whole, you know, draft situation, like he talked about that man to man with Howard Cosell and Howard Cosell talked about it man to man with him. So I, I think that's a phenomenal one for those that haven't seen. I agree. Like go look them up on YouTube. They're, they're hilarious. Number one, but they do talk right. about some awesome stuff. Sure. 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 Um, Stuart Scott would be another one, uh, you know, more recent, uh, you know, person, you know, by all accounts, a, a, a wonderful human being, but I believe Stuart Scott revolutionized uh, sports journalism in, in, in terms of how he incorporated uh, whether it be, you know, kind of, you know, quick rhetoric, uh, slang, you know, and those mm -hmm. sorts of things, the way he just kind of reported on things. I think uh, we talked about paradigm shifts. I think Stuart was responsible for shifting the paradigm in, in terms of just how on air uh, personalities cover sports. And mm -hmm. I, I, I enjoyed him. Today, I, I would say that, you know, some of my favorites are uh, the guys that first take. I, I, I like the fact we talked about opinions. I like the fact that that's one of the few you know, shows out there uh, where, where they can still manage to, you know, give strong opinions okay. on, on things, uh, again, ranging from, you know, substantive to non-substantive issues in and around sports and society, uh, and have respectful dialogue, right, and disagreements. Right. You got Max and Steve and, and uh, Molly and, and whoever their guests are, right? I love that. For sure. I love uh, Shannon and, and um, Skip. Uh, yeah. Skip, right? Skip, you know, skip, again, skip. you know, so yeah, th those, those kind of come to mind. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it's good, good stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, those are good ones. I think, uh, the folks listening might hear one or two of those names from Alex and, and myself might. when we, you when know, get to we'll the see. big three. I tried to get out of there today. I didn't want to do the regular. So I'm trying to, I, I know I got some good ones too. Make it, you know? I, I can tell you definitively that Stuart Scott is on my honorable mention list because I knew that we were all going to talk about him, but I mean, he's, he's the goat in my opinion. I, I think gotcha. he, I agree. Revolutionize. I mean, cool is the other side of the pillow. I mean, how many people have said that, you know, in their life? So I agree completely. So Bobby, thank you for coming on today. Uh, I think that's great context when it comes to, you know, not only how things have changed with media and sports, but also, you know, with our business and how a business owner can transition to the online space and really carry those values from, you know, the brick and mortar to the online store. So I think that's great. Thanks for uh, joining us. All right, let's head into the cool down. So Tanya, what you got going on this week? What you leading, reading and listening to? So on top of what we've been doing professionally, for those that don't know, we've had a lot going on with, we got a bunch of new employees. So that'll be fun. We'll get to yep, you know, hopefully yep. bring some of them on the podcast. And we've been uh, working through some stuff for clients. So it's been quite busy, but I have been listening to um, several podcasts this week. I've, a couple of the ones I've been listening to have been from Joe Rogan. Um, okay. So I know Joe Rogan can be at times be controversial, but I really, Joe Rogan had an interview with Ben Shapiro last week, um, mm -hmm. which for those that may not know, Ben Shapiro has a very successful business called The Wire um, or The Daily Wire, I'm sorry, and uh, a podcast that goes with it and has a lot of followers. He's um, normally, you know, a, a pretty right wing um, take on stuff, but he, he does shoot things pretty straightforward a lot of time. Joe Rogan is very much in the middle and leans toward the left side. The interview was really good because I thought it gave a lot of perspectives that Americans have about racial inequality, about COVID, about the economy, about the election. And really, I think was, I would recommend people listen to it because I think it kind of gives both sides of the coin and talks about some real issues as well as they both see each other's side, which right. I think uh, we don't do enough of in this country anymore. Yep. We just get mad and, and yep. cancel people out. So I thought that one was really good. Um, he also had another one. This one's a little bit off the radar, uh, but they, he had on these two guys that have been studying UFOs for a long time, and it's okay. uh, you know, coinciding with the government coming out last week and saying that they they have been and they have identified or they have uh, recognized the existence of UFOs um, in our country and have been studying them for a while. So these guys talked about some of that. So I would recommend listening to both those podcasts. I thought they were really good. All right, you're about to have me down a rabbit hole with this UFO stuff. Um, thanks to Luke coming on our last episode and steering us back up <laughs> with our conspiracy stuff. theories. It's good stuff. But I'm I definitely going to dive into that now. Um, for me this week, uh, like you said, we've been kind of pretty busy with the firm, uh, looking up bids and uh, onboarding a few new people. But 
Uh, honestly, man, I've been getting really nervous with the baby's due date coming soon. And my oh, buddy's soon. telling me that they can come from like four weeks out to three weeks out. And I'm like, bro, I'm four weeks out now. Like I'm getting kind of scared. So I've been watching like all the baby videos I can on YouTube right now. So that's all I've been up to. You're inside the 20, man. At this point in time, like you're focused on that. So I get it hundred percent, hundred percent. All good. All good. So our big three this week, uh, like I said, we talked about a little bit with Bobby and we talked about a little bit with John earlier is sports media personalities that we really like, um, whether from the past or current. Uh, so we talked about earlier that, you know, some honorable mentions, uh, you know, definitely Stuart Scott. I think we all love Stuart Scott. I think yep. he really changed the game. And then Howard Cosell was actually one of my honorable mentions as well. I know it wasn't during my lifetime, but I've always enjoyed watching you know, oh, highlights from him. Yeah. So for sure. So do you have any honorable mentions you want to list before we get started? Uh, I'm going to just throw out there uh, Shannon Sharp because he's hilarious and uh, his clips go viral all the time. and He's doing yeah. a great job. And I like, funny, I like to see man. how far he's come. But he's for doing sure. great. For sure. All right. So I'm going to let you go first so you can uh, go ahead and do your number one first and I'll go. All right. Uh, number one for me is uh, Darren Rovell. Um, writer, Ooh. producer uh, for the Action Network. Um, Hot one of my take, favorites, man. you know, one of my favorites just because, you know, he reports on stuff I like to follow, you know, uh, sports betting mostly, but also he'll throw some uh, random sports memorabilia stuff out there sometime, you know, whether it's the latest, you know, shoe that's selling for 200% over retail or, or uh, maybe like a graded hockey card, you know, hockey rookie trading card that's selling for like $30,000 on eBay. So yep. stuff I like to keep up with just to, you know, my little side hustles personally. So he's one of my first ones. For sure. And the business side is always really, really interesting. Um, so my first one is probably going to be on a lot of people's lists, but I think he's one of the best is Scott Van Pelt. I've loved SVP for a long time and I loved SVP and Rosillo when it was on the radio. I remember yep. listening to that all the time and some of my internships in college. And then um, I love SVP at night now. I, you know, I think, unfortunately, the world has changed. And because of that, Sports Center is not the quality that it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that SVP at night has some really awesome interviews. I think what he did this spring, like highlighting seniors that didn't get to have their senior game or whatever it may be, I think was really, really cool. Plus, I'm, I, he's real about everything. You know, he talks about, he gets emotional about things. He gets happy about things. I think yeah. him and Stanford Steve are, are some of the best. Man, now I was gonna put him on the list, um, but I switched it up a little bit right at the last minute. But I do love watching the show at night, especially when they go over the bad beats from the from the weekend. Man, oh, yeah, man, hilarious stuff. stuff, hilarious stuff. Oh, uh, all right. So my second one is gonna be Nick Wright. Uh, you know, uh, first things first on FS1. Um, he always comes with the hard hitting facts and the stats and percentages that you would just never think about. Um, it puts them in perspectives to where every player is in a sense, like apples to apples, um, especially when he does his blind comparisons. Um, so you're not always just going off of the big name or what they've did in the past performances, but you get to see what, the, what they're talking about today and how they stand in the, in the field as a whole. Yeah, the, I agree. The blind comparisons are great. So my next one is, uh, Dan Katz, also known as Big Cat from Big Barstool Cat. Sports. <laughs> I, love I did not Big know his first name. <laughs> I love Big Cat, man. I think he's hilarious. I think he does a great job of towing the line between being real about things mm -hmm. and, you know, also, you know, taking you away from, from the world for a little bit and just kind of enjoying what's going on. You know, he goes all in on everything they do, whether it's, you know, pardon my take, which is, you know, in my opinion, one of the best podcasts out right now, or whether it's, you know, Barstool Radio, any of the content they put out. And then, you know, on the flip side, he talks about real issues too sometimes. You know, yep. they uh, recently, you know, uh, Barstool president um, Dave Portnoy interviewed Donald Trump at the White House and Big Cat came out and spoke about it afterwards about how, you know, he kind of felt that Barstool was being used and all this stuff. And I, I think it's great for someone who has such an influence on so many people to talk about real situations that he's right. going through and, and also be hilarious. Yeah, I think he's one of my favorites and always has great takes. Spot on, spot on. I like that one. I like that one. Um, so my third one is going to be Bomani Jones, uh, probably my personal favorite. Um, has a show on High Noon right now on ESPN and also has his own podcast called The Right Time. Uh, but he's from Houston, Texas. Um, his mom is an 
a philosopher. His dad's an economist. His sister is a award-winning novelist. He has two masters and a doctorate in economics himself. Um, so he brings like this intelligent perspective to sports entertainment, um, as well as bringing this perspective from the black community as well as a whole. And just has a lot of takes that not other, not too many other broadcasters and journalists explore. And at times, some of his stuff seems a little radical, but also he brings the facts behind it and the research to show that his statements are all just true statements and the facts are out there to the public to see. And it's just a different bias and a different way of seeing it that's coming through his eyes um, as a as a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think Bomani is great too, man. I love I love his educated takes, just like I love you know Shannon's like kind of off the wall takes. So I think those right. are both really good picks. But Bomani's right. a great one. So my last one is one that I don't think many people are going to know. Um, but so Alan Roach is my last one. So Alan sure. Roach is a PA announcer. So he, when I, growing up in Denver, he was the PA announcer for the stadium PA announcer for the Rockies, the Avs, and the Broncos. Nice. Um, and was, I mean, phenomenal. And because of that, he now does all the Super Bowls. He's the PA announcer for the Minnesota Vikings, the Olympics, I mean, the guy does Dang. everything. Like leveled you, up, man. When you hear a voice in a stadium at, at that level, it's yeah. usually Alan Roach. He just brings so much energy. You know, I think that being a PA announcer in a stadium, there's a very fine line between being entertaining and being cheesy. And he does mm-hmm. a really, really good job of keeping you know people you know into the game and right. and making good comments without it being like you know crazy off the wall. So I right. think he's one of my favorites for sure. I like that one. That's nice. Yeah. So, all right. So let's, let's move here to our Q and a from the listeners this week. So we have one question um, that, that got sent in. So it said during the interview with Luke Wilson last week, Luke mentioned being authentic on social media is the best, best path to build a brand as a business owner who's looking to expand his following. How can I remain authentic while drawing more online interaction? So I, th- I think this person's asking, how do I draw the line between clickbait and being authentic? Right. So I'll go ahead and go first and I'll kick it over to you, Alex. I, I mean, for me, I think being authentic is key. And, and I mean that in, in a couple of ways, right? So being consistent, like Bobby talked about with your views, I think is the best way for people to understand who you are. You're going to draw the following you want based on, your values and your authenticity, right? Mm-hmm. If you're strongly on one point and you are continuously talking about that, providing value there, people are going to come to that, right? right? You don't have to have clickbait. Now you can work on creative titles for stuff. You can look, look at the way you word it, but I think remaining true to your value, um, being authentic and then finding that right crowd is, is the way to go. I mean, mm-hmm. you talked about this last week. It's easy to make a quick buck on social right. media, right? Going with things that are out of your value system or a clickbait, but the longevity and the, the quality of the following you gather, I think is largely based on the authenticity values and consistency you have. So that would be my recommendation. What do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm 100% on board with that. Um, I kind of think about this stuff all the time. My sister-in-law is a DJ, like an up-and-coming DJ here in Houston, and we brainstorm just on, you know, just random stuff all the time. And, and again, it's not much you can do to to differentiate yourself as a DJ, you know, and she wants to remain authentic, just like the person's asking the question. But at the same time, I, I just tell her, you know, put the content out there, but make sure it's content that no one else has. Make sure it's something that stands out from the rest of the pack. Like you can remain authentic and give your audience what they're looking for, but also you want to differentiate and give them something to look forward to, you know, give them something to come, come back to look at the next time, give them, uh, you know, maybe a contest, give them a, a different opportunity to something to see, give them, uh, you know, this different content, whether it's, you know, you're doing just photos now, maybe you can switch it up to videos or maybe you can yeah. switch it up to a countdown to where it's anticipating something like that, you know, give them something that'll draw them in, but still being authentic at the same time. For sure to interact. And I think you might have actually retweeted this or I saw this on social media the other day, but um, there was a, an artist that, you know, a rapper on YouTube and he was talking about how he has all these videos that have hundreds of thousands of likes and no producers ever picked it up. And he had a right. producer call him about a song that had 246 likes. Right. He's like, he's like, it was my, like, I, I made the song because I felt like it was really good, but it didn't catch on with, you know, it wasn't the clickbait, the masses, but that's the one right. that got him what he yeah. wanted. So I think that's a lesson in itself. Right. So just put the content out there. Your, your, your core fans and your core following will, will pick it up and, and lead the way also. And I think that's a great segue to end the show, Alex, what you just said, like your core following with the right stuff is what's going to carry you. Uh, you know, John talked about that earlier. 
as you know how his career has evolved and how he stayed true to himself and the way mm-hmm. he writes and because of that he still has such a huge following bobby talked about it with athenian right we may have gone from brick and mortar to online, but through that stayed true to our values. And because of that, people still know our pedigree and know what they're going to get. So I really hope the listeners today got a lot of value from, you know, hearing how that interaction has changed over the years and how important that media relationship is, whether it's for a business or whether it's for, you know, a professional sports organization or an athlete uh, influence or whatever it may be, you know, that staying true to yourself and, and how those news cycles have changed are really, really important. So guys, thank you so much for joining. Keep uh, sending us in questions. The one we had this week was great. We have several others. We got teed up for the next couple of weeks, but yep. keep sending them in on, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on Twitter, um, or to info at athenian.group.us, And we'll make sure we get them answered on the show. So as always, take time to breathe and focus on your current situation. Adversity breeds ingenuity. And Alex? Wise counsel leads to sustainable results.